Hello, everybody. Thank you very much to following this panel today. I'm here with Dr. Denis Zakharopoulos uh, and my fellow artists and friends, she uh, Sheba Chachichi from New Delhi and Matt Merlikan from New York. And we will start this panel now uh, talking about this issue that was announced. Art for the World is an NGO that is uh, basically working on the main issue concerning our planet with contemporary artists and filmmakers from all the horizon. We work beyond the traditional boundary of the art system in creating cultural project opportunities for larger audience. Our most recent project is, is this long feature film realized by 11 filmmakers from five continents on the raising awareness and environment on climate change and it calls interdependence and illustrates through short stories the relation between the four elements water, air, fire and earth and also the interdependence we mean between the human being and the nature and can be even understood as well as an interdependence between all of us from different background, cultural background, knowledge, race, religion, gender, etc. Here we have a trailer of one minute, please. The title of our panel is, If a Prospect is not a Prophecy, it is a View, is a quotation from a short essay, Prospects in Arts and Science, by Robert Oppenheimer. I would like to leave the word now to Dr. Zakharopoulos to say uh, his point of view on this title. Thank you, uh, Avelina. Thank you, friends, artists, Sheba and Matt. And thank you for the audience to follow this panel today. In fact, in 1954, uh, Robert Oppenheimer wrote this uh, text for the 200 years of the Columbia University of the celebration. And uh, in fact, uh, the point was uh, how far objective issues like you can have a kind of overview, uh, the scientists uh, try to get as an objective view of the world, should have been confronted with more subjective views, which are, let's say, more linked to everyday life, to a non-specialized -spe person. And uh, to say the truth, just looking at the uh, trailer of the film uh, Adelina von Furstenland produced about interdependence uh, to show how far very different things, different people, they are dependent on each other, uh, no matter uh, their uh, discipline, no matter their way to proceed, their gender, their origin, etc. But especially because as individuals, as singular views, uh, they offer a very wide uh, range of differences that give us the possibility to be in the world and to relate to people's life instead of just being in closed circuits of 
artist or scientist or whatever. Uh, it is quite important to reconsider this text today uh, because uh, what is the mean of uh, a text like that is to bring back uh, to what today is more uh, urgent than any other moment with the, ex the experience we have with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic that we need to relate again to the human being. To the human being, not as a matter for scientific research, not as a representation of artistic processes, but as a, a motor for whatever we do, as a, uh, as, a, as a sense of awareness of life, of being alive, as a sense of what the values of life are, which is for everybody, which are the means to move from, let's say, an egos, ecological world uh, to an ecological world, as a lady here said a few days ago, and I found this issue extremely important. How to move out from the ego to uh, the other, and the others, not just the other, and the others uh, all together uh, giving an, a, a huge amount of difference, which are what we call civilization. And that is what we call culture, I would say even more than civilization, which is very seriously uh, uh, attacked by the life we live, by the market, by all the things they try to reduce into objects, what should be awareness and consciousness about human life and not just uh, things, commodities to exchange like artworks, like medicine, like uh, things like that we can find in the shops, which are very important. But on the other side, we have to live with feelings, with ideas, with thoughts. And these are beyond the limits of art or science. They are part of our culture. And this is what artists have in a very important way always offer. Therefore, this view, uh, it may be also sometimes a prophecy, not because artists are making prophecies, not at all, but because intuition can be read from one epoch to another under different keys, under, under different codes. So we can read today and we can understand today artistic and probably in, uh, philosophical or scientific intuitions in different ways and uh, make of it part of our today awareness. That means they have been prophetic uh, some decades or some centuries ago. And therefore, I believe it's wrong to think that artists or scientists are making prophecies, but their intuition opens horizons to reinterpret the world and reality uh, through awareness and consciousness. Uh, transforming languages and in that sense, transforming also the meaning we, uh, we uh, give to the things and to ourselves. So I believe there is nothing more important than to hear the artists we have on the panel talking about these things, because it is not the point to hear about their work like, uh, 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 like an art critical proposal but to think about their sensitivity and about their awareness in front of what happens, not on comments, because we are full of comments and blah, blah, but how they individually, they feel in their own uh, person, deep in their life, in their everyday life, with their children, with the other people, with their friends, with uh, 
the rain or the good weather, about harmony or catastrophe, uh, and how with both they can make possible openings for having more hope and more uh, tools to cope with this very difficult situation humanity is confronted in th these days. So please, uh, Matt Malik and would you start uh, after me? Thank you. Okay, my name is Matt Mulliken. I was born in 1951. I live now in New York, but I live in Berlin and New York. And in uh, 1973, I wanted to enter a picture. It was uh, a drawing. And I put my mind's eye into this picture and I walked into it. Walking into it, where was I walking? I was going inside this imaginary universe. And as I entered this picture, I was immediately uh, 14 years old and it was 11 o'clock in the morning. It had rained the night before and I was gonna go visit my father who was working in a forest. This all came immediately. I wanted to go into the picture. Um, one can say that all pictures, that means photographs, films, posters um, are mental. They don't exist physically. They are magic. They are in between um, reality as we all see it and what we see of that reality. They're, they're magic, as I said. Uh, so pictures in themselves uh, hold us, and yet we're not sure where we are when we're being held. So Film. I wanted at this point... Film. Yes? We put the film. Film. But I just, okay. And so I uh, went into this, uh, this picture and there's a sign of the world. This is a, this is a film of an exhibition I did at the Hangar Pekoka in Milan. It held 6,000 drawings. These are all paintings on a wall, roughly, you know, 20 meters high. But going into this place, into this picture, uh, it, as a child, I, I, not as a, yeah, while being a child going in, uh, I was going into this mental space, into this place. Now, when you go, when you see any, any picture, any sign, we understand what that sign is and we participate within it. Going into the, my work can be broken into uh, five worlds. Uh, the first world is the elements, the materiality, uh, the, the, the world of, um, of, 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 of parts. The second world, so that would be earth, that would be earth fire, water, air, and uh, the breaking down of material. The second world is the everyday, the part of the world that we live in, my breakfast, my lunch, my dinner, my sleeping, my waking, my driving. The third world uh, represents the arts, the, the, the film, writing, uh, uh, picture making, uh, 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 performing. That would be uh, the theater. Uh, that would be in the, 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 the third world. The fourth world is language. That would simply be uh, signs that we see, uh, pictures, signs uh, that, that make, that have meaning that we understand. And the fifth world would be the, uh, the subject, the subjective. I, uh, the cosmology would be fitting into the subjective. So uh, my, my, before I'm born, what, what happens uh, after I die? What happens before I'm born? Um, I also work with hypnosis uh, in relationship to this. Uh, one of the questions that I'm interested in is how do I think? Do I think in pictures or do I think in words? Uh, I know I don't think in words and I'm pretty sure I don't think in pictures. So if I don't think in pictures and I don't think in words, what do I think in? I think in feelings. They're much faster than words or pictures. Uh, they, they are multi-level. And when you're entering a picture, when you participate within the media, you, you are always feeling, you are always thinking. That's me uh, performing in a trance state. 
I work with hypnosis and I'm going into the subconscious. So you have the subconscious and the trance state on one level and on the other level you have uh, the elements, the first world and the last world and you're always going in between. Both are always happening at the same time. They are continuously, both, both worlds of the, the mind and the world and the elements are all coexisting all the time. Our minds do not stop. Our minds create the world as we see the world. They coexist, the combination of the two. Um, so my work, uh, I've been working with signs uh, since 1973. It looks very much, very contemporary in the sense that uh, we, we, uh, we live in, in this world more and more through the iPhone, through the internet. Um, and w back in 19, in the mid seventies, people thought that I was talking about Egypt and the Mayans and all of that, but really it had to do with contemporary life that had yet to be, uh, produced. I worked also with virtual reality very, very early on. Um, I'm very much interested in media and, uh, the magic of this kind of communication. Matt, can you move a little bit your uh, image? We don't say exactly. Oh, is that can, you <laughs> can you say something about your concept of cosmogony and the contemporary life? We all have it. I mean, cosmology is a, is a social phenomenon. I represent it in my work. Um, it, it's something that, uh, like, where my cosmology involves uh, before birth and after death. Uh, what what is the order of the of the of the world? You know that's that's in a sense how how I'm uh, I'm involved with the contemporary life is is continuously changing and it is of course at one level very literal and a very you know very very strong. In another level, it is ethereal. It is it is. It, it, it's a feeling that we have. It's a, it's a, it's a way of, of thinking. It's a way of feeling. Thank you very much. Okay. We, good. So we okay. will continue the conversation. Uh, we, have, uh, we are on time. We are in a good schedule. So now I would like to give the word to Sheba Chachichi, who is in New Delhi with us today and we too we work for many years and please Shiba say something. Uh, we, we can't hear. So good evening, good afternoon, good morning. We are all in different time zones and I think this is a very special quality of this moment where we are isolated in our own homes and yet in a curious way connected this whole proliferation of webinars and Zoom meetings is a peculiar phenomena. This period of the COVID pandemic, the lockdown, the isolation, has been one of introspection, thinking. The isolation is not unusual for an artist. We often spend a lot of time alone in our studios, thinking, feeling, working. Uh, but in this time, a particular image from a work that I had made almost 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, kept coming back to mind. So I'd like to start by just sharing that image very briefly with you. So this is an animated light box. And it is an excerpt from a much larger work, which has about 12 animated light boxes. Animated meaning one layer moves while the other layer is still. The work was provoked by the murder, the wide scale murder of birds because of the panic over avian Asian flu. Uh, in fact, what we found at that time was that the flu itself, was produced by breeding practices, industrial breeding practices, agribusiness, farming, and in, was a, a product of global supply chains and industrial farming, rather than something that birds uh, brought to humans. The parallels with today 
are many. The uh, people in contamination suits <clears throat> populate our screens today. The uh, movement of the COVID virus from whatever form of wildlife, it's still controversial, bats or pangolin or whatever, to humans uh, is deeply linked with the destruction of wildlife habitat, which is linked to agribusiness. So in a way, there's a pattern here that we're seeing being repeated. Now, is this work prophetic? Does it describe a prospect or does it describe a view? I think it is all three. It is uncannily prophetic, which is why it's been coming back to my mind so much in this time. It is also a prospect because the COVID pandemic is no surprise. It is the latest in a series of messages that we have been getting from the earth and from the web of life that things are seriously out of balance. Uh, it is also a view because it is presented, created by myself as an artist seeking to share this insight and to open up a discussion on the interconnections between people. So now we go to another work. The work is called Nilkant Poison Nectar. These are all large installations. That, that's what I really do. The proposition that underlies the installation is a state of toxicity, of poison where all the five senses, and in Indian thought, the five senses are homologous with the five elements, are in a state of poison. Images of garbage fills, landfills on the outskirts of the city of Delhi, where garbage is slowly turning into land. So is it land or is it garbage? As we move through the installation, as we enter, we are in a kind of bird's eye view over, is it a city? Is it a body? Perhaps it's a body city. The city has, it is isolated, fragmented, but reconnected, connected through pattern, connected through the wires that loop the little towers together. And you're drawn in towards the center of a mandala-like form where you see this video. The video is, is, is of a gigantic throat on which are projected images of garbage from the landscape, uh, landfills, and the kind of toxic materiality of a hyper-urban city. It draws on a myth which is still popular in India. It is the story of the time that the gods and the demons for once decided to work together. They knew that they could not extract the elixir of immortality, Amrit, on their own. So they joined forces and they began to churn the cosmic ocean. As they churned with great effort, many things appeared, but not the elixir of immortality. In their greed and in their desperation for more power than they already had, they continued to churn. And what then emerged was this terrible black mass of poison. It was a poison that threatened to destroy the universe. There was one God who was aloof from the process. He opened, moved by what would happen to the earth, to humanity, to the universe. Moved by compassion, he opened his mouth and he swallowed the poison. Even he could not actually swallow it. So he kept it in his throat, and henceforth he was known as Nilkant, Blue Throat. So in, for me, this is a perfect allegory for the kind of greed that is driving hyper-urbanization, capitalist consumption, the kind of structures which have determined the destruction of the environment today. So in that search for nectar, immortality, just like the gods, we have produced a poison. Today, we are perhaps like Nilkant, trying to, struggling to swallow the poison, to ingest it, but we are able to barely contain it 
barely able to breathe. The throat is both archetypal, mythological, and human. This work has had a curious life, and I want to tell you about one very interesting manner in which the work was presented. There's a theater artist who created the situation of a mock trial with an act, in an actual court, with an actual judge, and with evidence, and with witnesses. Her argument was that artwork could be a witness. It was called evidence, landscape is evidence. This work was presented as evidence trying to change the rules of what is admissible in terms of objective documents normally within legal processes to an interpretive uh, something based on a deeper investigation and a deeper understanding of our condition. It was a trial on the question of ecology and pertaining particularly to a river linking project. I think what is the most important today and what the pandemic has made transparent is the underlying principle which Adelina began with, the principle of interdependence. We are part of an enormous, intelligent, mutable, constantly evolving, changing web of being, from the smallest blade of grass to the most powerful head of a corporation, we are all interdependent, interconnected, and co-creating what we inhabit. This understanding is something that philosophers, environmentalists, ecologists, activists have been speaking about for a long time, but it is an understanding that has remained within the purview of the few. I believe at this time it is really important to bring this understanding into the public domain. A lot of my work is public art and it is the closest to my heart of all the work I do, whether showing in museums, galleries, or in other spaces. I believe that we have to open dialogic spaces where we offer more complex readings and a more complex conversation to a much wider set of people, to move out of the elitism of where art is usually enshrined. This moment is, a, I think, a critical moment for us to really examine how we can offer the great privilege that we have as artists to imagine alternative alternatives, to offer these alternatives, these, to offer these imaginary alternatives and bring them into a common understanding, into consciousness so that we can make choices that can change the kind of condition that we presently inhabit. Thank you very much, Iba. Thank you for your word. What I would like to underline here that the sphere of art is not limited as you see to the beauty, but embrace everything. That is a common interest of life, not only for scholars and experts, but also for all of us, for ordinary human beings. Such is the content of art and science. What is culture? Culture is a mission undertaken with aims of educating by bringing the best of human thoughts and creativity. But in the last decades, our contemporary world, the role of culture was badly exploited. Media and advertisement, among others, have satisfied the needs of consumistic society. Instead of increasing culture and education, all this was done to stimulate desires who was gratified, gratification is perpetually postponed. 
So I rec by the way, I recommend to read the book Culture in a Liquid Modern World by Zygmunt Bauman that is very interesting today, uh, today's world and today the degeneration of a certain type of knowledge. So therefore I would like to ask you one by one, starting from Matt, how you think that there is a possibility of revive the situation and restore the authority of art and education in fulfilled lack of culture today? <laughs> then I ask the same question to Dennis and to Shiba. As so, you are an educator as well, you teach in, in Berlin, you work with young people all the time. So tell us a little bit about this perspective. Well, art is something that we all do all the time. We are continuously expressing our, 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 our thoughts, our, uh, our feelings about where we are. And, and, and I think that the, if you look at media as, as the subject uh, alone of, of, of the world, then it, 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 it's, it's quite banal. I think what happens is that it simplifies what we do. Uh, to such an extent that it becomes kind of ridiculous. I, I think we are much richer uh, than, than that. Uh, I think we, we, we think on many, many, many different levels continuously. And if you just start to look at, at that process, you'll see you know, how, how rich our lives are, but we, 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 we dumb ourselves down to such an extent. We don't dumb ourselves down, but the media uh, the fact that the world becomes uh, two-dimensional uh, is, is dumbs us down. I think it's just a matter of uncovering these things, the, 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 these ideas that, 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 that occur. And so um, th th this is what I do with my students. That's what I do. I mean, we, we simply, they, when I talk to my students, they say it's all been done. You know, all the new ideas have all been thought out, you know, a hundred years ago. There's nothing new that it's, 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 and I don't believe this. I think there's so much that we don't know. Uh, it, it, it's a rich out there. And, but we, it's a matter of how, how we orient ourselves to this, to this problem. Um, so I, I, um, I give tours I, I, uh, of, the, of, the, of the city I live in with my students. I, um, I've done this since I was actually in high school myself. Uh, we would do this. I would do this in the, in, the, in the late 60s, early 70s, give tours of the world, you could say. It's a much richer place than, 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 uh, than one, what, that one would believe. This pandemic is interesting because it's, it's, it's broken everything down into our house. So now, whenever we go out, uh, if you go to the market, it's, it, it's quite something or go to someone else's house. Everything's been reduced, reduced, reduced. I, I am myself very much interested in, in the universe of, of where I live and, and, and what I see uh, directly, independent of, of course, uh, the media. So that's, that's, that's the point. I mean, uh, working on the street is, of course, very, very important uh, to have that kind of interchange with, with, with others, with other, with other points of view. Dennis? Uh, Thank you. Quite, quite, quite important question. And uh, I'm happy also that uh, I see in the questions we got that uh, Mr. Donato has asked also a very similar question to us to define uh, if we relate to beauty or, and how it relates. And I must say that uh, since a very long, beauty has become an uh, extremely problematic concept. Uh, today, definitely because beauty is very much associated with cosmetics, uh, if not with pornography. And on the other side, because uh, in the 19th century, beauty was very much related to canons of antique models, we had to copy. And so that means beauty, it was as, oh, nearly always, especially in the art schools, a matter of conformism. 
it was to have a forum and to ask people to conform themselves to this notion of beauty. I would rather prefer to say that the big poets have already given something which is much closer to what visual artists like Sheba or Matt have said also, that beauty is terrible. Uh, Sheba has spoken uh, in her work about catastrophes as possible uh, vehicles of understanding the limits of beauty. Because let's say beauty can be spectacular in both ways. It can be spectacular as, as, as an advertisement. It can be spectacular as a catastrophe. You don't know what to do in front of it. It's the same thing. You can go to a party and to see a man or a lady very well dressed and very handsome. And on the other side, when, once you fall in love with somebody, you don't look at you. <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, the, heaven, the hell is falling on you and you lose every rational relation to beauty. Uh, therefore, I would say uh, today, the question of beauty is somehow to find again the possibility to cope with all these catastrophic uh, images of everyday life as they come from everywhere in a world that it looks to most of the people as a very narrow place uh, in terms of information. Uh, the earth has become an object you can see on television like, like, like a bibelot you would put on your on a furniture. And uh, uh, on the other side, as Matt said, I mean, uh, I'm happy to read every day uh, articles about unexplored parts of not only of reality, but even of the earth. They discover cities who haven't even thought they exist because they are in the woods of South America. They discover cities, they are under the earth because the old city has moved elsewhere and it is part of a new city like in Italy. I mean, the place, so the new means, uh, radars and uh, uh, photography and uh, technology, etc., uh, can help to see beyond the image, to see beyond the information, to get again the sense of surprise. And that, I believe, is for me the first thing that gives to art the re its real authority. It's that art surprises us. Uh, if you go to a museum, you don't look at the richdom of the princes and princes, princes of other epochs. You see things they somehow uh, catch your uh, uh, curiosity because they surprise you. You don't know what they are. Uh, the less you know about a painting or about an object, the more it becomes part of the possible beauty and of the possible uh, search for new openings in reality and also for the authority of imagination and the authority of artistic processes or creative processes to cooperate and to communicate with real people, with simple people, not for artists to talk between them. Uh, nobody cares if everything has been done and you find it in an encyclopedia. Scientists also, everything has been discovered somehow and they continue to discover every day uh, new things, same thing like the artist. Uh, and therefore I believe that your question about authority is how to make people again curious about what they don't know, which is what pushes an artist to continue his or her work and to be an artist. This, uh, I mean, it's interesting to see that Matt was talking about five world and Sheba is talking about five elements and five, uh, 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 so I thought elements were four, but in India they are most probably five from what I understand. And uh, it's exceptional to see how this shift of meaning creates uh, the possibility for 
all of us to be positively ignorant. Ignorant not because we haven't learned our lessons, ignorant because we are curious about what we don't know. And for that, art is definitely the most efficient tool we ever found. To because when you look yourself at the mirror, you understand your face, your identity, etc. But if you look yourself to the mirror with the eyes of the art, you look what Matt calls that person. You look another person than yourself. So I guess to introduce that person in our life and to have always a possible position for that person to go and that we have somehow to accept, to welcome, to follow or to get threat or to get uh, friendship gestures and relation is what art for me is giving as a possible authority in the super highways of information and media, etc. And uh, reintroduce the positive way to concentrate on something at, as Sheba said, that on one side, when you are in your studio, like a scientist, when he or she looks at a microscope, they do concentrate on something. And that is, of course, uh, a very partial uh, view of the world. But through that partial view, you can reconceive, conceive again, a uh, huge uh, reality, uh, cosmology of another universe, of another set of possible worlds that gives to the art, and probably to the sciences, the authority which called culture and not uh, application. I would like also, Sheba, before leave, uh, giving you the word, I would like to add something to this uh, Dennis uh, statement. So we have a problem in the in culture in general and in art, in every sort of arts in particular, mm -hmm. is the last 20 years, let's say, is the inter, the huge interference of the bureaucracy in the field of art. In one side, I say bureaucracy in the sense of uh, the big institutions. In the other side, I, will, I can also say that art became a commodity and investment, which gave this a fa false idea of what is art and what means the diversity and being uh, the working in with another logic that is not rational. The artist Lawrence Wiener used to tell me, the artist has a logic that is not rational, but it's his own logic that it makes that the work of, that comes from his mind, it works, that is an artwork. So this logic is not so much respected anymore by the bureaucracy. So me personally, through Art for the World, I worked with, the, for more than 20 years, now I'm working with the mother of bureaucracy, which is for me the United nation, but there I, I was able to create and I was able to do all the works that I was freely uh, committed because it was a respect to the diversity because in this mm -hmm. institution they are used to work with differences they are used to work with every sort of uh, people languages and religion whatever so in one side is the matter of the bureaucracy but the other side is today maybe it's the institution that gives you the most freedom to work therefore Art for the world is very, um, I, I want to take this occasion to express, I'm very grateful that I had the possibility to work through uh, this institution uh, in on different parts of the human rights issues. But when I go back in my usual world of art and institution and museum, I found a very old fashioned way of dealing with things, always the same system, always the same uh, uh, attitude of uh, jerarchy and uh, value related uh, to many things that I don't need to mention here. So I think uh, the first thing is important for the art world is to make uh, personal 
or how you say autocritic in French, autocritic, to transform and to reform the art world in order to then be able to give that to the artist the possibility of, of freedomly work uh, publicly in a public art or in, uh, in, in different fields and, and, and take back the authority. So Shiba? Well, to add to what um, everyone has said, uh, Dennis, Matt, uh, Adelina, I think it's important to look at what art offers. And one of the things that it offers is the possibility of contemplation, of the different quality of attention, because the encounter with an artwork is not mediated it is not structured, the temporality, the kind of time, the kind of way that you look, receive, experience, uh, is for me a very important part of resistance to the highway, to, to the mediatic universe. It's also, uh, to extend that idea, uh, for me, the kind of art that I'm really interested in and I practice, is an art of sensorial immersion. Uh, the media is dominated by eye and ear, by sight and sound. And of course, there's some attempts now at commercial exploitation of smell, etc. But I think the kind of sentient sensorial experience that an immersive artwork can offer also brings the person back to their body. And I think embodied experience is really important. We are moving further and further out from inhabiting our bodies. Just as we don't inhabit our bodies fully, we don't inhabit the art fully. So when we speak of awareness, it is not just some nice broad idea. It is absolutely grounded in the way that you are within your body. And I believe that art offers that possibility of embodied sensorial encounters, which is very important. I but, think you can say something about this, no? Matt? Oh, in, in, in the body. <laughs> the mind and the body. Uh, yes, uh, I mean, we are content. We, we, every second of every millisecond of every day of every hour of every minute, we are, we are uh, thinking we are in the world that we see in that world. And at the same time, we are in our bodies. The bodies are very, you know, we, and not only uh, do we see the picture, but we feel the picture through our bodies. Um, I'm very much interested in, you know, when I was uh, with, at the very beginning of my work, I would say, all I see are light patterns. So when I see you, what I'm actually seeing is light. That's all I'm seeing. But then again, my body and my mind create you. And that is, is very important, uh, that, that that creation exists. So, uh, and that is continuous. And it's a matter of taking this world, uh, for me, my, my investigation is in a way taking this world apart. What does it mean to, how does it feel? How does it, how do, you know, the senses, where am I? What am I doing? Where am I going? All these, all these ideas which I accept and have been accepting my whole life. But then if you start to think about it and look at it, they start to, to, to break apart. And you start to, and when it breaks apart, then you start to be there. You go past the, you know, the, the signs of how things should be or could be or would be. You, you, you just are there. You are in the world. And that is, in a way, what my work has to do with. I mean, uh, at one point, uh, I say to myself, have said to myself, it's amazing that anything exists, anything, uh, nothing should exist in, 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 in a way. I mean, in, in the universe, uh, it's surprising that here we are. It's a surprise. And, and, and my work has to do with that very simple uh, idea 
And at the same time to approach that idea, I seem to have to talk about everything, almost like an encyclopedia. So to get to nothing, I have to go through everything. And, and the two happen at the same time, like, a, like two mirrors, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then through that, you have vibrations. You have vibrations. And then the vibrations comes this reality of, of, of the self. You know. <laughs> you absolutely perfectly consonant with Buddhist philosophy, which speaks of nothing existing in and of itself, but all existence being part of what is called dependent origination through a chain of causality. And that all perception being something that is created and does not actually exist in and of itself. Anyway, this is a, perhaps a discussion we could have at another time. <laughs> uh, it would be, I would love to do that. Uh, I think what's, what's really beautiful about what Matt is saying and what we're, we're trying to point towards is really different ways of seeing, different ways of thinking, different quality of perception. We are in a structure where the ways we've been told to think, feel, receive, give, is in a state of complete failure. We have to pay attention to ourselves, to how we actually are, to, to inhabit and to inhabit with full recognition of being part of that great web of co-creation and interdependence that I spoke about. In terms of what has happened to art and culture, I think it is because art and culture offer the possibility of more complex readings, of a less reductionist view of the work, and therefore, of a resistance to the dominant paradigms and the dominant ways of thinking. I think that is partly why art and education is actually always the first to go. When there's a recession, it's art and culture that is the first to be axed. However, we can, uh, I think as artists, thinkers, writers, we continue because we are not doing a job. We are we make work because that is who we are. It is part of our questions about the world. It is our questions about the universe, about ourselves. So we have to find a way of bringing this very special, very unique capacity into a more democratic conversation, into a conversation that reaches out to a much wider set of people. I think transdisciplinarity, which is a very important part of my practice, is another really important aspect. I think every exciting contemporary artist today is interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary. Uh, the new thinking, uh, there's some really exciting new thinking about ecology, uh, about the Anthropocene coming from feminist ecological thinkers, and for me, I draw on that, I draw on Buddhist philosophy, I draw on pre-modern knowledge systems, I draw on scientific studies. All of this comes together and informs the work I create. This is also something which pushes against specialization that we are forced into, into the boxes into which thinking is put. This is what I was speaking when I was mentioning bureaucrats, bureaucratization of the art. The, what do you think, Dennis? Oh, definitely. And uh, it comes to my mind uh, because I see that this, uh, uh, this Donato is asking this question about if we have also something to say about this bureaucratization, uh, not only of the UN, but of most uh, international or major institutions. And I would say, we have always to remember uh, a very short story of Borges, uh, who says, who talks about a man who wanted to make a map of all the world, the entire world. And he managed to make one at one scale, one-to-one -one 
uh, map of the world. When he came to the, po to the point he was, he couldn't paint the map of the world because he was stepping on it, you know. And uh, the, real, the, the reality is that you can have an image of the entire world except of the, this very little space we occupy. And on the other side, in your, and that, that's important for the institution to know that they can always have images of, or, 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 or listings of all possible things except of one, that their own list we won't, won't be part of the listing. So there will be always a list, always a, 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 a map, always a chapter, always a little thing that will stay out. And that is what makes this hierarchy and this bureaucracy, etc., very relative. On the other side, for this little thing, there is something that was said very clearly by both Matt and Sheva and by yourself. And I saw it specifically in one of the images of the interdependence movie, having this man hugging, giving a hug to a tree. And it made me think of a little booklet uh, on a French uh, forgotten today painter of the 50s, uh, where his work was photographed by Lartigue, the photographer, and where you have the painter in his studio with his paintings and his children and little children, etc., in front of the work. And Francois Mauriac, the really major French writer, wrote a very short uh, introduction to the work of this painting, of this painter, saying, as a writer, I cannot find the words to talk about painting, because somebody asked if we can help also to understand painting. But I can give you an example. When I was a child, there was an oak in front of uh, my windows, in front of our door in our courtyard. And I was loving this oak. And I wanted to uh, say to the walk and to, uh, to the oak, and I was having no words. I didn't know how to talk to a tree. So the only thing I tried to take this tree on my arms, and it was too big for me. So I kissed it. I give a kiss to the tree. And I believe that this kiss, which is a little bit the blue throat in a way, how to transform poison into energy for life, how to transform images into experiences. Uh, it's also what you will find in this little part of the map that can be, cannot be part of the map you'll put on your drawer. And this is the real authority and the real medicine against bureaucracy also. So thank you. We thank you very much for this. We arrived at our end of our one hour. I am looking at the, the text. I don't know if you are looking at your left, uh, the right side of your screen, the different uh, comments uh, of the people. I am very thankful to everybody that they wrote so many nice things on Sheba, on Matt, on, the, on this conference. So I don't know. There are no questions. There are only statements. No questions. Yes, you no, and me, the four questions. Well, look, what question is it? I can't see it. Q&A. Should I read out the question? Yes, please. Okay, so this is from Donato Kiniger. I hope I'm... I am Donato. Uh, art from Michelangelo onwards is about material and immaterial transformation. What kind of transformation is art seeking for you? Is beauty an element into it or the search for beauty? Is art an element of inspiration for an intimate and collective sense of leadership. Then he has another question after that, so I'll add that to it. Adelina, what can art do to revitalize and reinstate the values of the United Nations? Could art be used to fight bureaucracy and promote mutual understanding across nations? If yes, how, Donato? My question could be for all panelists. Thank you for an excellent discussion. So Matt Staten. It, what? The, the, the question was started uh, to you. No, can you read once more, please? Oh, 
Thank you so much. Um, so beauty transformation uh, is is that what we are seeking throughout? Can the bureaucracy be transformed? The UN bureaucracy be transformed to uh, open up better conversations between nations? Can art be used for that? Um, these are the two key points. I, I hope I'm not leaving anything out. I am, I am sorry, I'm not saying, but anyway, I can answer quickly to the question about United Nations and art as I, I am used to working with these two fields. So I think, yes, as I was saying, the United Nations can play an immense role in embracing art, not as a PR for their uh, opening, because I, uh, I, I'm sorry to say such such governments and such such artists, etc. But they can really embrace and and uh, take advantage of the artists who are uh, like uh, Sheba says they are not doing this as a job. The artists are doing this as a life. A time uh, experience. So this could be very useful to have a, a, a side in a way. I always say that we, we, we can't change the world with our art, but we can give awareness to the world. This is already a very big issue because they say uh, the artists want to change the world. It's, that doesn't work, it's impossible. I, this, this is, but giving awareness are people like the artists, the creative people, the filmmakers, musicians, writers, poets. We need more poetry. We need more um, trans, trans, how you say, um, we need more, um, uh, not a linear thinking, but transversal thinking. Think is that pass through the different, uh, and rem you remember, Matt, when we did together, you participate at the 50th anniversary of the UN 25 years ago in Geneva. Yes. You did this big installation in front of this gigantic monumental, uh, monumental building that is the UN that represent, let's say, the officiality. And you artists, you had those small uh, uh, cabanon, small huts, and you create your work. And each hut was represented another uh, individual, but also global, universal way of thinking. And this is it, this confrontation between the big, huge situation that more and more becoming, um, at least they don't make you breathe anymore, if I can use again this uh, quotation. And then the individual thinking of the person who have a universal way of opening the doors. This yes. is my uh, suggestion. I don't know what to think. Matt. Well, the individual, I mean, our, we are so rich, uh, the indivi all individuals are so rich and, 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 and somehow we, we, we live through, through signs, we live through the signs of power and we just have to be independent uh, of that and to, and to really uh, just express ourselves. Yes, I'm not, I'm not uh, my art is my life. And, and of course, uh, and, I'm, and I agree with you, poetry is more and more important. Uh, it, literal thinking is, is it's just becoming so dominant. So I think, I, think, I, think we, I think the session has ended. Thank you all. I enjoyed the discussion. Thank you, me too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank bye bye. Thank you. Bye thank, bye. You. thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, for the Arts and Academy for inviting us for this session. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.